here, no, as you know, normally when you begin training, you usually begin with Bhopali or Yaman. So there is a school which begins with Bharat. Sure. Yeah, just, now in South India, what rag do you normally begin with? Which we call as Maya Madhavan. Komal Vishav, Komal Dhevan. Komal Dhevan, that is the first, that, that's the reason, you cleared up a mystery for me. Yeah. <laughs> but someone said, so you always begin with that. We always start with that. That's a complicated uh, round yes. to begin with because that's precisely right. it has the, out of your three rays, yes. it's the lowest ray. Lowest. So the three girls is the highest. Highest. So the interval is yeah. very large. So that's right. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So but the, but the Purva and the Uttarang are the same. So yeah. that's, simple. That for a beginner sense. it makes yeah. it something. One of India's greatest writers, Vikram Seth, poet, novelist, travel writer, memoirist, librettist. The range of his genius and what he has produced is, as we all know, astonishing. And we're extremely privileged that he could be here to pass participate in the Hindu's first literary festival. His early work, beginning with his volume of poetry called Mappings, was followed by his travel book, From Heaven Lake, travels through Sinkiang in Tibet, and then the remarkable Golden Gate, followed by a suitable boy, both to worldwide acclaim. In 1999 came an equal music, and in 2005 his non-fiction family memoir, Two Lives. In between, he's published several volumes of poetry, and we look forward to hearing more about his latest work, The Rivered Earth, which is being published in December this year. In his author's note in the book, he has said, Music to me is dearer even than speech. Equal music. Dying, undying, a dying fall, a rise. The waves of sound well around us, even as we generate them. Helen and I at the heart and to either side pierce and believe. Our eyes are on our music. We hardly glance at each other, but we cue and are cued as if Hayden himself were our conductor. A strange composite being we are, not ourselves anymore, but the Maggiore, composed of so many disjunct parts, chairs, stands, music, bows, instruments, musicians, sitting, standing, shifting, sounding, all to produce these complex vibrations that jog the inner ear, and through them the grey mass that says, joy, love, sorrow, beauty. And above us, here in the apse, the strange figure of a naked man, surrounded by thorns and aspiring towards a grail of light. In front of us, 540 half-seen beings, intent on 540 different webs of sensation and celebration and emotion. And through us, the spirit of someone, scribbling away in 1772 with the sharpened feather of a bird. I love every part of the Hayden, it is a quartet that I can hear in any mood and can play in any mood. The headlong happiness of the allegro, the lovely adagio where my small fingers are like a counter lyric to pierce a song, the contrasting minuet and trio, each a mini cosmos, yet each contriving to sound unfinished, and the melodious, ungrandiose, various fugue. Everything delights me, but the part I like best is where I do not play at all. The trio is really a trio. Pierce, Helen, and Billy slide and stop away on their lowest strings while I rest, intensely, intently. My tunoni is stilled. My bow lies across my lap. My eyes close. I'm here and not here. A waking nap, a flight to the end of the galaxy, and perhaps a couple of billion light years beyond. A vacation, however short, from the presence of my two present colleagues. Soberly, deeply, the melody grinds away, and now the minuet begins again. But I should be playing this, I think, anxiously. It is the minuet. I should have rejoined the others, and I should be playing again. And oddly enough, I can hear myself playing. And yes, the fiddle is under my chin, and the bow is in my hand, and I am. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me again in welcoming Vikram Seth and Nisha Sudha. So this book consists of four libretti, um, plus, an and all of those are in verse, whether translated or original. 
in front of each of these there is a short introduction explaining something of the background of that particular libretto each of them is set in a different country each of the first three um, they were set to music they were performed in three different festivals in England they were broadcast and CDs have now been made or are being made of the first two of them and I hope of the other two as well in the Indian libretto the third year which is called the traveler which is the story of the soul traveling through its various stages of life I don't just have four ashrams uh, you know childhood youth uh, uh, the working life and the and uh, uh, sort of retirement and renunciation but I also add the unborn and the dead I had this uh, the wonderful uh, hymn to creation in the Rig Ved has seven uh, shlokes so by having uh, seven uh, pillars I was I needed six arches and four of course were there but then I thought yes how about the unborn and there's a lot of poetry written about that idea and then a lot about death uh, and about grief and how one deals with it so that's why uh, within the seven uh, shlokes I inserted um, secular and sacred texts and some poems of my own dealing with those particular stages this of life. Really interesting section. Why, why do you feel this um, fatal attraction for these really structured, very you know, uh, corseted forms? <laughs> well, they're corseted, but you can sing with them uh, in them as well. I think if at some stage the poem doesn't make sense uh, or doesn't move you, then there's no amount of skill of rhyme or meter is going to justify it then it's just like doing a crossword puzzle and it's not really worth much more than that but if the poem is, has something to say in its own right then sometimes the constraints themselves suggest things that you wouldn't otherwise think about and the fourth year what I decided to do was rather than um, go to another geography China, India, Europe I simply took the seven elements from these three cultures um, earth, air, fire, water and we have Akash or space and the Chinese have earth, metal, wood, fire and water so earth, air, fire, water, space, metal and wood I wrote one poem for each of them the first form of fire mother give me the moon I want it as my toy mother I want it soon or I'll be papa's boy no I won't plait my hair I won't go out to play, I'll sulk on the ground all day I won't come to your lap, so there No, will I drink this milk from Surubhya cow Mother I want the moon and I want it now Here in this bucket filled with water it scatters but that one there never shatters cold in its silver fire climbing higher and higher I now know mother you only love Balram my brother who loves to drive me wild he says you bought me that I'm not your child no don't sing me a tune Mother, give me the moon, the moon, the moon. Fire, 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 oh, fire, 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 desire. Hot, 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 I'm burning a lot with desire. Oh, fire, fire, fire. Hot as a filament wire, hot as prawn jambalaya. I am burning so hot, I am baking a pot. Oh, hot, hot, hot as desire. Fire, fire. All was born from me, all your eyes can see. Who gave life and birth to sun and star and earth? Who gave pulse and germ to man and beast and worm? Who is hot, hot, hot when black space is not? Who is bright, bright, bright in this endless night? Fire! Fire, fire, oh fire, 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 desire, hot, 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 I'm burning a lot with desire, oh fire, 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 hot as a funeral pyre, leaping up higher and higher, I sizzle, I daze, I fizzle, I blaze, I scorch, I toast, I smolder, I roast, I flare, I excite, I flash, I ignite, I rage, I lust, I blaze, I combust, Red, yellow, white, I light up the night, this endless night, with desire, oh, fire, fire, fire. Uh, yes.
I was just uh, comparing, rather contrasting it with the Jaipur Fest, where they started the festival first and later an award. And in your case, you have begun with the award, and now you are organizing a festival around it, uh, which I think is uh, quite good, so that it becomes a major cultural event. Another reason why the Hindu has loomed large in my life is because of Nirmala Lakshman, one of the paper's great editors, and the person I would credit with single-handedly investing the paper with its fine literary credentials. It is fitting, therefore, that in its 20th year, the founder of the Literary Review has, in her usual indefatigable and inspired way, started both the Premier Literary Prize and a literary festival. Thank you all for coming to support the festival, and I wish it very well. Thank you. As a philosopher scientist once said, it is in literature that the concrete outlook of humanity receives its expression. And it is this literature with its enriching, illuminating and enlightened spirit that the Hindu Literary Review tries to capture and regularly bring into the hands of its numerous readers. In the two decades, we have not just promoted good writing, but also sought to engage with larger questions about the nature of literature and what writing means as a private act as well as a public project. We've debated issues of freedom of expression, censorship, the boundaries of creativity, and depicted the essential enmeshing of writers with political, social, and cultural issues of the day. Caste system is actually, it is um, almost instilled in the blood of our society. It, it begins when a, when a child is uh, conceived, and uh, even after death it doesn't go. Even we have separate graveyards. See, when K. Venmani, 42 people have been burnt alive and the accused, prime accused in this case was Gopal Sami Naidu, who was released by the court and the first person to garland was him, the ex-chief minister, you know, applauding his victory. In Mudugalatur, there was a huge communal clash and Pasampan Muttaramalinga Tevar was one of the accused and now people are worshipping him as Guru. Dalit writing is Dalit, is writing about India and about Indian society. And I've always felt that is writing a healing, a little bit of an awkward phrase and uh, essentially what we're trying to convey through this, uh, through this session is, is how um, the, the act, or the st how, how the struggle to assert one's, uh, or assert and affirm one's humanity in the face of oppression through through writing, through literature, uh, brings healing, and healing in a in a wide in a very wide sense, not just in a uh, psycho phys physio psych psychological sense, but uh, I would say healing even in terms of addressing the uh, the uh, oppressive state in which uh, one finds oneself. So this is broadly the theme that that we want to to deal with today in this session. Are the writers or uh, wounded or hurt ones and uh, do they represent the victims of long awaited injustice so that they need to be healed first and then they can be showcased as a witness to rest of the victims then we inflict pain on one section of our society and this pain social exclusion we experience and when we try to write it down what happens is even the scars become wounds again. When it comes to Dalit writing I wonder how from the stroke of my pen I can cure the culprit as well as the victim at the same time. Who are the others? who consider themselves above this pain and misery? Are they engaged in uh, writing some multi-drug regimen for varied illness of the society, whereas I am stuck with one and the only one? Or, in reality, all writers are some sort of healers and they assign areas for themselves. Okay, I'll write about this only, whereas I write about this. Do words have the capacity to hang loose between injustice and justice? 
how to let go physically, mentally, emotionally, how to let go feelings physically, mentally, spiritually of the hurt. What could be more healing than winning back one's stolen humanity? So that is that our writing does to us. Why do you give concessions? By giving concessions itself, you are uh, telling me that uh, you are nobody and I am your savior. Lord. It was uh, mind-opening uh, to, to hear the Dalit uh, writers speak. And uh, I, just, I just feel like, uh, that uh, my life has been enriched in these two days. Sitting down with me this morning are two extremely talented writers, Kaveri Nambishan and K. Srilata, for whom 2011 has been a pretty stellar year, I think. Uh, Kaveri's book, the story that must not be told has been shortlisted for the DSC prize that honors South Asian fiction. Yes, a round of applause would be fantastic. Thank you. And Sri Lata has had not one but two books published this year. Um, Table for Four, which was also uh, shortlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize, sorry, long listed. Uh, which was published by Penguin this year, and the Writers' Workshop in Kolkata published her book of poetry arriving shortly. Our first night was spent in Harini's uncle's house in Delhi. We had the privacy of a room. I changed into my pajamas and lay in bed, wishing desperately to postpone the feat expected of me. Harini emerged from the bathroom in a fresh white petticoat with a blue blouse and three-quarter sleeves. I stared at her radiant waist. She sat on the bed. Have you washed your feet? I bathed in the evening. As soon as we reached, I said. You should wash your feet before getting into bed. I never forgot it. The first that first night, when I came back to bed, having washed my feet, Harini received me by ardently biting my ear. Have you, I think, read Ambedkar? Read who? B. R. Ambedkar. Ambedkar. I have read some of his writings. I yeah, have because not read uh, you were you were saying something about Gandhi, and uh, he is a contemporary to Gandhi. One, secondly. He has written about 50,000 pages. No one writer has surpassed. I felt more connected to print and books rather than people. But when I, when I hear the people behind the books, the, the, when I saw the faces behind the names, uh, it's changed me a little bit. I feel that's great. One night there was a mushaira. I was sitting in the front row with Bade Bhaijan. The air was filled with expectation. Finally, I was going to hear the celebrated poets. I had spent hours before a mirror, trying on one kurta after another, and had settled on a white karga kurta, a white shalwar, a dupatta skillfully dyed in the colors of the rainbow, and golden Salim Shahi shoes. I was determined to overshadow all the other young women. Modesty was never one of her virtues. When Kefi began to recite his poem, Taj, I felt impelled to fix my gaze on this tall, slim, and charismatic young man, whose voice, God help me, had a timber like the rumble of storm clouds. How brave of him to recite a powerful poem against monarchy and injustice in the Nizam city. Bari Bhaijan turned to me and said, such a bold poem from one so young, these people are truly fearless. After the Mushaira, people rushed towards the three poets with their autograph books. College girls swarmed round Kefi like flies, but I preferred to wait my turn. And giving him an arch look, I turned towards Sardar Jafri and asked for his autograph instead. After the crowds had dispersed, I walked up to Kefi with great confidence and held out my autograph book to him. From the corner of his eye, Kefi had caught me going towards Sardar Jafri. And to my dismay, he scribbled some meaningless couplets in my book. The flaming 
cloud that seems to shine the earth of the nightingale's honor. Come into my domain like a secret, by my heart rings and lightning swings, grab the beauty and come into my heart. Complete nonsense. I was miffed. Kefi had is inscribed a charming couplet for my friend Zakia, who was beaming with delight, and I was consumed with envy. When we returned to Choti Apajans, I joined Kefi on the steps leading to the house and demanded petulantly, why did you write such silly couplets for me? Why did you ask for Jafri Saab's autograph first? Kefi asked mischievously, and that was the beginning of their love story. <laughs> There is this, um, an overarching narrative of the love story, but behind and beyond that lie very many other realities which shed a somewhat fascinating and really wonderful light on the lives and times of the poets who formed part of um, the Progressive Writers' Movement and the Communist Party. I think she was very saddened by the fact that uh, today, words from the Urdu language had completely disappeared and because she was born in Hyderabad and she felt that even the names of flowers, of fragrances, of months when she was a child were in Urdu and they've all now been replaced uh, by English. And so she started recollecting them and that's how it actually uh, started and then she was I think herself startled by this completely photographic memory uh, that she has. Amartya Sen has written a blurb for the book which is really quite outstanding. To say that this is a lovely book would be an understatement. It is an enchanting recollection, recollection of the life of a hugely talented and sensitive human being shared with a great poet. They were united not only by love and marriage but also and this is important. They were united not only by love and marriage, but also by an individually assessed joint commitment to social change, artistic creativity, and personal and political ethics. In this excellent translation, we have a lively account of an important part of Indian history, fired by sympathy, inspiration, and imagination, but tempered by the hardship of reality. So when this came, I was jumping with joy and I went running into her room and I said, Mommy, Amartya Sen has written this fabulous thing about your book. So she said, Achha, what was it? Then I read it out. She said, translate it for me. I translated it. That evening she went out and bought 16 sarees for herself. 16, one, six sarees. And when she came back, age 82, I said, Mommy, I have never bought 16 sarees in my life. So she looks at me and says, in your life, Amartya Sen has also not praised you so much. You just have one function which gives the award. Um, uh, it doesn't really, uh, you know, spread into the cultural life um, and the literary life. So, so I think it brings it together. Um, and uh, you have discussions on contemporary issues in literature and culture. So, um, and... Going by this year's program, it, it's a wonderful lineup. Um, and going by the audience, uh, you know, ob obviously there are interested. I see a lot of writing that has changed over the years. When I was like 20, the kind of dialogues that I mouth, they're not there anymore. You know, thank God they're not there anymore. Even in Malayalam, the kind of dialogues that I have spoken are not there today, which I think is fantastic. We always thought Malayalam films are more realistic, but their dialogues were, you know, the conversation was so dramatic and unreal. But today, the writing is so real and acceptable, it's smart, it's intelligent. So when I write for my husband's film or, or, or television or anything, I have that at the back of my mind, yes, this is what uh, you know, people are capable of writing. So All the best directors have tried uh, adapting books, sometime or the other, Balachandra, Bharti Raja, all of them have done it, Mahindra has done it successfully. They are filmmakers, they are not writers. I really want to know why you made this film, why you chose this particular subject. Uh, there's a chain of restaurants, Irani restaurants, which are very hospitable, which are very affordable. I've grown up in them. I used to stay opposite one. And uh, my best friends have been Iranis. Uh, to strike an even more personal note, uh, we were going through very difficult times, my family, so they would send the food over. Uh, 
So it's just a Valentine to them. Searching your way down your brand of cafes Must turn each other on your mind Just in that piece of your heart You lost your love the one day You want to forget she was there The city changes every day Every season, no reason She used to think that you could be forever You used to think that you could be forever So you were tired And uh, I've been brought up uh, by a group of, uh, you know, matriarchal kind of house where the women were wonderful. Uh, they were much stronger than the men, and uh, emotionally, and sometimes even physically. Uh, so I have lots of stories within me, and uh, I don't have to look outside. Uh, but Zubeda was, uh, yeah, immediately after the first uh, preview, uh, Mira Nair, who's a friend, yes. uh, she said, you know, I wish you'd lit a match under Sham's bum because uh, she felt it was not volatile enough oh, for sorry. something which had happened and uh, which had sought to be swept under the carpet. Uh, I tended to agree with her. It needed much more power and passion and a bit of uh, angst. Mm -hmm. uh, but then looking back and looking at the reaction and looking back now that it's about eight years since it's done, I think he dignified it a lot and uh, for that I'm grateful. Uh, I think uh, Shyam was right. Lit for Life was conceived basically as a literature festival around the literary prize that the Hindu has constituted since last year and also to celebrate 20 years of literary review. But having said that, we wanted to program it holistically that there is something for everyone to take back. If one does it well, all these things of plotting and if you have a very good, you develop your sense of language by editing and refining your language. You develop your, uh, your ideas, like your central idea for the book. What is the meaning that people are going to get from this book during the plotting and the execution stage? And, um, and at that point, you will have, in the end, such a book that uh, at least some publishers will feel that there's no way we can pass on this book. We'll just have to publish it because it's such a well-thought-out, well-planned, well-executed book. If you want to write, say, a detective novel, you don't have to associate with uh, criminals. You can just look at your own family members and you'll find <laughs> enough inspiration even there if you uh, pick the right details. Each characters have its own individuality. Individuality, yes. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes the individuality is so larger, I mean, it overgrows the plot. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, how can we, I mean, flush it down, how can we tone it down so that it flows with the novel, flows with the plot? Well, in a way, I uh, mean, you know, all characters are, um, what you see is that, like the tip of the iceberg on the uh, final page. So uh, it, there are ways of, of uh, dealing. Actually, we should have had uh, another 24 hours. Thank you very much. It was lovely to see you all and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Page, madam. Nilam meeri ilam kariya kodu poorum. Mumi lattuvi to uloga kalat irumbu thun poorum. Mundu thali moriyan tamum. Under Manukul Pudindi Vada, the Valam the Ripa the Podom, Kundal Virika than the Watri Pane, Kili Erin the Pondra Uchi Odin Indre Kalam, than Panjamuka Kaigalal, Panakuri, a Sorosor Pai Surandi, and the Marathil or Vaduopi Yetir in the Maram Uiro de Rikrada, in by the Marathi Podaway, or in Nin the Ragasi Mayer in the Manduk Mele, Maranam Yedia, as an Atma, Mandukadil Verodi, Nilampura, Uruadi Kundar in the அது உயிரோடு இருப்பதற்கான எல்லா சாட்சியங்களையும் இழந்து விட்ட பின்பும் தஞ்சாவூர் கர்த்தா கர்த்தாடாங்குடி சர்க்கை திருமக்கள் அது உயிரோடு இருப்பதாக நம்பிக் கொண்டிருந்தார்கள் சர்க்கை திருவில் வசித்த 
இருத்தலுக்கான அங்கீகாரம் தேடி மதம் மாற்றப்பட்ட கிறிஸ்துவ மக்கள் அந்தோனியார் மற்றும் சவேரியார் கோயில்களோடு அந்த பனைமரத்தையும் எந்த விகல்பமும் இன்றி வணங்கினார்கள் மாலை வேலை தவிர மற்ற நேரங்களில் அதன் உச்சியை பார்ப்பதற்கு சந்திரனும் சூரியனும் அனுமதிப்பதில்லை மனித பார்வை புலத்துக்கு மறைந்து கொள்ளும் மரத்தின் உச்சியில் சில குருவிகள் தங்களின் மிகப்பெரிய உலகை உருவாக்கி வைத்திருந்தன like a pillar left over from the iron age stood a lone palmyra tree a testimony to three generations of prayer no sign of any spread out hair on its head indeed the head itself was missing as if someone had pinched it off and tossed it away time with the five elements as its hand tools had stripped the palmyra of its rough native texture and given it an unnatural smoothness was the tree alive or dead the truth was a secret as long and dark as the tree itself above ground its life force had been extinguished but under the ground like a vast network of roots its atma had spread everywhere even though it had lost every last visible trace of life the people of tanjavur's karuttangudi sarkai street continued to believe that the tree was alive in sharkai street lived some people who had converted to christianity seeking self respect and social recognition these people worshiped the palmyra tree just as devotedly as they worshiped at the church of saint anthony and saint xavier except in the evenings the sun and the moon would not allow a view of the pinnacle of the tree on this tree top which was immune from the gaze of the human eye some sparrows had created a world of their own that's just paragraph 1 of a fantastic story express that feeling is more reflected in the first one where he says seem to keep a watch over these dead bodies and grieve over them watch maybe it's not so very clear but grieve over them is the right one because there he feels that you know ye jo lashe wahan pe thi that is reflected more in this his feelings are more reflected in okay, the okay can i ask you something what called grief let's go back to that expression sir dhunne wali baat literally what does it mean literally dukh se apne aap ko ye try to say you know try to mention that you know uh, with a feeling of regret you're trying to show that it's not yes ponder, ponder. no so we are hearing two different interpretations ponder regret nahi dukh se dhunne wali baat okay will you give me a sentence with that expression never mind premchand also whether they like to mix so what a translated in each case meaning i think the translator has interpreted that expression now the question is do you want to interpret it in a particular way because then you are saying this is the only reading possible and you are depriving readers of all other possible readings or are you going to create a phrase that most closely approximates the action and leave it to the reader to decide what it means sorry i didn't He's get that saying no. that if you cannot write your own book that's when you will translate <laughs> they're saying it you're saying it to the wrong person no no that's that's not me <laughs> absolutely i shall i shall protect you from his rage <laughs> no 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 spot it. on that's me in <laughs> fact i'll tell you honestly i have personally reached a point where i will never be able to write anything of my own again right now when i talk to my wife i first write it down in bangla then translate from it i can't do it in the first 6 days uh 430000 copies of chetan's new novel were sold on the first day alone over 17000 were sold on flipkart and these are these are phenomenal numbers it's never never happened before in indian publishing and i don't just mean english language publishing for this in this in this short duration this kind of uh sale so yeah that has that has transformed publishing what is interesting is that editors practically every editor in town in delhi at least turned down these books before they became big english publishers have an active interest in an awareness of um the importance of translating let's say 
there is a way in which they are enriching their lists and because English is the channel of so much um, communication about publishing and so much discussion about publishing and because English is what is internationally represented a market which is not unimportant to publishers therefore the inclusion of translations can then perform several of those functions as well which is why I think it's important to talk about them as an as an active policy that English publishers might have but the challenge I think which we would all have encountered is the quality of the translations mm. and I think it is much better not to translate a really good book badly mm. uh, and publish it if if you only have access to an indifferent translation it's much better not out there mm. let it let it remain in the original language so I think that that really is the biggest challenge finding good translations I think one of the most exciting projects that I had this year was a translation it was a book by a Malayali writer called Sarah Joseph and it was translated by Walson Tambo and I found it really exciting because for the first time I was involved in a simultaneous translation as in Sarah was writing the book she was sending the chapters to the translator to Walson he was working on them and I was looking at the book while it was still being written and it was incredible the experience of working on a book that's being written which you're used to doing with the English language when you're working on drafts with the writer but here was someone translating it and then giving feedback to the writer saying you know maybe something could be read differently or written differently and she was taking that on board and then I was doing the editing and we managed to bring this out in such a way that the Malayalam edition and the English edition were released on the same day so I wanted to know from each of you uh, one subject that you wish people would write about and one that you wish they'd stop writing about. <laughs> That's a nice one. What I would really like to see less of, but I know I won't see less of, and more people will publish, and we will too, is the seven laws of success. The <laughs> best way to make money, you know? And we will do lots of those copies because they sell and they sell and they sell, and I don't need to be passionate about it at all. I look at it and I say, that many copies, publish. That's it. Um, what I'd really like to do, if any of you has a great erotic novel sitting in you, come to me. I now know that two publisher, uh, publishers are interested in erotic things and, I mean, erotic novels. So, uh, what? Uh, how many, uh, okay, how many number of prints can you promise to? Um, and about literary fiction, you know, it isn't as if literary fiction is going out of fashion. Um, I mean, at the moment, uh, one writer who I, I think is completely incredible um, is Muhammad Hanif and um, his last book sold large numbers uh, this one is doing very very well and then there are many other such you know uh, success stories of what you would uh, call literary fiction and non-fiction happening so and recently while reading the wonderful novel uh, The Remains of the Day by Ishiguro I found the narrator Butler Stevens posing the question what makes a great butler and, pr and he proceeds to discuss this at length and reading it I could not help but think he's taking the piss, he's taking the piss out of sports writers but it felt worthwhile in the manner of Butler Stevens to turn this question towards one's own vocation what indeed may make great or even good sports writing who better to answer this than Indians for Indian it was who wrote the greatest sports book of all time his name was Ved Vyas and the book was called the Mahabharata full of game plans and valor and cheating and duels that shake the heavens and featuring the mental breakdown of a star performer before the big match followed by a wily pep talk from an experienced coach and Mughal first uh, who I know is particularly delighted with this unforeseen trend in contemporary literature which is the rise of the cricket novel uh, the Mughal I should tell you that cricketers tell correspondents that their reports are fiction hmm? thing is in the last three years there have been three completely first-rate novels which are centered on cricket uh, one is uh, a novel written by the Irish writer Joseph O'Neill called Netherland which is set in in all of all places New York uh, there's another one there are two by Sri Lankans one is the match by Ramesh Gunasekara and then there's this completely marvelous novel by uh, Shehan Karunatiliki, which is called Chinaman. What they actually show us is how central cricket is and how central the nation is in the imagining, in the imagining of cricket. The interesting thing is what it tells you about 
uh, the way in which cultures come to cricket. Um, for example, if you read uh, the two Sri Lankan novels, they're very different novels. But what they have in common is both their writers are, are completely possessed by cricket. And the, the reason they're possessed by cricket is because they're possessed by the nation. And uh, cricket is a way of both imagining the nation and struggling against its proprietoriness. Both of them are impassioned pluralists. For example, Ramesh Gunasekare, when, he, when his protagonist hears of the pogrom where Tamils are killed in, uh, in Sri Lanka in 1983, uh, the protagonist is a Sinhala. He, you know, he's completely ov overset by this, and he despairs of the country from which he's ex exiled. In the same way, uh, when you have uh, the central c character in, in Chinaman is this retired, disillusioned journalist who, in a sense, sets out to rehabilitate himself and his nation and the game he loves by searching for a great cricketing genius, Pradeep Matthew, half Tamil, who he believed never got the deal that he ought to have got. Netherlands, for example, was hailed in America as the great 9-11 novel. It was a novel about 9-11, about an investment banker who's caught up in all that, going through a divorce. And he happens to be playing cricket every weekend with a motley bunch of characters, including a rather mysterious and shady Caribbean Indian immigrant. And that is that entire subtext. And in some ways, uh, yes, I was surprised that Americans could get the novel because the cricket so much suffused it. But I was not sure that it would be fair to consider it a novel about cricket. Whereas uh, Karunathilika's book, Chinaman, is very much a novel about cricket. Its central preoccupations are it's a novel about an alcoholic sports writer, a cricket writer, who uh, is on this obsessive quest for this um, fictional but very vividly imagined Sri Lankan spin bowler, uh, whose biography he's writing and about him he's trying to make a film and so on. And everything, including the jokes, the observations, the philosophical digressions, are anchored in a knowledge of the game. And the book will make absolutely no sense unless you know cricket. Where I would argue, Mukul, uh, about the first, your very first observation, uh, which you disparaged, that cricket has uniquely produced great literature, is that it has produced great literature that is not fiction. That if you look at uh, a book like C.L.R. James's Beyond the Boundary, if you look at Ram Guha's uh, Far Corner of Foreign Field, if you look at, uh, in a very different way, because he's more anchored in journalism, Rahul's book on, pa on the Pakistan tour, your own book on men in white, you find that the sport, and even writing nonfiction about the sport, so it's obviously written to be about the sport and to be read by people who care about the sport, even then, cricket, perhaps uniquely, inspires the writers to go well beyond uh, the mundane descriptions of the daily activity. <laughs> It is possibly one of the earliest uh, examples of travel literature that we have in India. Um, when Rama and uh, his, his uh, wife and his brother, they walk through Dandakaranya or Gujarat, depending on which historian is telling the story to us. Um, they see certain birds, they see flowers, they see trees. They meet uh, what are called Rakshasas by some people. And uh, in many ways, we absorb that information, but what we are looking for is what happens to the person who is traveling. What happens to a prince when you take away his palace, you take away his parents, you take away his armies, you take away his prospects and say, now you are on your own, you are kicked out and let us see what, what in essence is Rama, what, is, what in essence is the individual, any individual who leaves home and walks about. I think, uh, I think we have to do a whole panel with Professor Giri's questions, but real risk. quick answers. Okay, the first one was the risk. Uh, I mean, Guyana does actually have a very high murder rate and people are quite quick to take out a gun or a cutlass, but it was not exactly like going into Baghdad or Rwanda or something, I was fine. Or Pakistan, as mm -hmm. Mohammed Hanif shared with us. Yeah, and below me there's a young family of three. Um, the husband goes to work, the boy goes to school, and the wife and I, she helps me with just finding my feet there, gives me food to eat. And one day she comes up to help me with some newspaper cl clippings. And I realized this was the big thing because this is Indian Guyanese uh, people who've just moved from the country to the city, quite conservative. 
and she's helping with me with newspaper clippings and suddenly there's this thumping up the stairs, these wooden stairs are shaking and there's this man, the husband has come into the room and he's stomping around the living room and saying, and he's going at the, uh, his wife in hard Creoles, not disrespect me gal, no, I pass me, I pass is the Creoles term for don't disrespect me and it's getting kind of out of hand, I said just sit down, have a seat, relax and so he looks at me and he sort of takes off his shirt and there's a gun at his waist and he puts his hand on the gun. You tell me to sit down, you don't know me, bye. I could do things, you know, bye. I could do things to you right now. For writing on a particular experience, you have a window, a small window. The time when you arrive and everything is fresh and new. And then suddenly the point where you don't notice the new things anymore, when you are actually at home, the irritation is gone. That is a window. Thank you all and thank you both. So the first thing that I look for is, is it, uh, does it interest me? What makes me want to do this film, do this into a film? So, which, which means the soul of the story. Soul in our culture is Atma. The Atma, if it interests me, I take the Atma. So Atma has so many births. So in the previous birth, this Atma was a short story written by somebody. In the next birth, it is going to be a Balmahendra film. When I read Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea, hmm. there was very little story-wise in it. The old man goes, there's a shark and comes back. It was such a wonderful novel. <laughs> so, but still, when I saw the film, Somehow, I could not get that feel, Gone with the Wind, the film was better than the novel. But at the same time, it was not the same thing with some of the Shakespeare's plays, I said. I'm, I'm very sad many times that Shakespeare is not today when the film is there. He was such a wonderful screenplay writer. So if you see Hamlet or Othello and all that, because of the limitations he was having on the stage, he could put everything, only a limited thing. But there was so much outside that was happening, whether it is Romeo and Juliet. So I could imagine so many things, but where Orson Welles as Othello and Lawrence Olivier as Hamlet, they were all very convincing. But in spite of Brando doing Mark Antony, it did not convince me. Some more Julius Caesar and all that, because in my imagination, there was a different Julius Caesar, not Brando. Now, when you think of songs in these films, you know, which is outside of the story screenplay, you know, do you want to integrate it or do you also just like to leave it for its own pleasure? Indian blood is different. You know, you come from Yakshagana. You see, I know the stage dramas, either Marathi, Telugu, I know Telugu. Arjuna comes and Duryodhana comes, Krishna is sleeping. Arjuna is somewhere at the foot and he is at the thing. And Krishna gets up, first he sees him and then gives who is on this side. And the moment he sees him, his brother in law, Bava Yapudu Vachitivi, that is telling that is, when did you come? Suppose you say, Bava Yapudu Vachitivu, it won't say that. Bava Yapudu Vachitivu, that's the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Dalu, sir, your final statement on what is going to be the cinema of tomorrow? I really can't uh, fathom what tomorrow's cinema is going to be. But as long as I live, I will try to make the film the way I want to make it. Experiencing the joys of it, I mean meeting with so much better intellectual peoples, conversing with them on a different sphere, on a different level actually, it blows your mind actually. It's like an out of box uh, experience. And the best thing is that it opens your mind. It means it's like creative, extremely creative. When you're starting out, you don't really know who your readers are. Uh, basically, I used to say that I, I write to please four or five of my uh, close friends, you know, sort of people who I will show it to whenever I finish. And uh, in a way that you're trying to uh, please them, trying to impress them, trying to turn them on, trying to kind of, you know, do all those things that writing is supposed to do. Uh, now, uh, since uh, I wrote my first book, I have found out that for some very strange reason, then in Pakistan, most of my readers are people who are very, very young, like scarily young, teenagers and people in their early 20s. Okay. I have a 13-year-old son, and whenever I go to, uh, to 
pick him up from school, uh, there's always like somebody, you know, sort of 17, 18 year old will come up to me and start talking about, you know, sort of uh, this thing in the book or that thing in the book. Uh, and that thing used to freak me out a bit because, you know, sort of teenagers are supposed to do fun things. Why are they sitting there reading these morbid books? Uh, but now I've uh, kind of started to uh, enjoy it. I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a good thing. You catch them young and, uh, you know, sort of uh, you, you can make a living for another 10, 20 years till they kind of grow up and start reading like serious stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think how do they have access to the books? I mean, are they sold? Uh, are they bookshops? Yeah, like yeah there, are, there are bookshops in Pakistan, okay. yes, strangely <laughs> enough. No, I mean, I think what you want... We you have ice cream too, by the way. <laughs> no, and there are, uh, and, 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 and there are kind of, uh, uh, it doesn't make publishers happy, but there are lots of uh, very good pirates in Pakistan, so I've bought like my own <laughs> copy, f books copy from like in three different versions for 100 rupees, so they, they buy it like, they buy pirated copies, which I think is fine. And I think uh, publishers tend to package kind of novels that way, that here's a sort of brilliant new book uh, by Pakistani, about Pakistan. I'm quite uh, skeptical. I mean, there is a whole mini industry uh, in the publishing world about uh, non-fiction about Pakistan. And some of it is really good and some of it is completely crap. Uh, if you really wanted to get an insight into a country, that's what you would read. I, I, I don't really know why anybody would pick up uh, my novel and then hope that he'll get an insight uh, into a whole country. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that's how it works. But I guess that's, that's, how it's, that's how it's sold. I'm trying to tell like a very little story set in a little corner of Pakistan about like, you know, some really not very significant people. Uh, I think it might kind of, you know, tell you something about yourself. I get influenced by almost everything that I read, uh, including horrible newspaper op-eds. I, and, and, uh, and not just books. I, yeah. I, uh, I think uh, you watch TV and you get influenced by that and you watch right. films and you get influenced by that and you, and you hear a singer and you get influenced uh, by that. Uh, another major influence I think uh, in what I write also comes from uh, uh, in Pakistan since a lot of people actually you know sort of don't read or can't read you know because they... Right. Uh, so, so their expression um, about their lives, about the politics, about, about their mohalla, about their you know sort of city uh, that comes from this uh, banter like they stand on a street corner and they and they talk about uh, uh, stuff and their idea of uh, and their idea of political commentary is that if you can sum up like you know sort of everything in a little joke or in a line or in a little uh, a couplet and uh, obviously that doesn't get written down it's not right. considered literature by by sort of literary people yeah uh, but i kind of uh, used to hang out uh, with a lot of uh, uh, those people mm -hmm. uh, so i think they kind of uh, influence me uh, a lot. No, I really uh, sort of uh, object to this uh, word that we kind of use quite often these days, which is uh, minority. And I keep telling my journalist colleagues as well uh, that there's something wrong uh, with this word because as soon as we use it, what we're doing is that we're kind of absolving ourselves of any kind of moral or political uh, responsibility. That it's like a little kind of, you know, it's it's like small and insignificant, like a little passage. But you're doing positive. that all the time in the book. Uh, am I? Yes, because you're calling them untouchables in, I, in your... Uh, I, I, I don't think I call them untouchables even once in the book. Uh, their people might have kind of those kinds of uh, issues uh, uh, with them. Uh, but that's uh, not my concern uh, in the book. My concern in the book is uh, this woman's uh, mm, love story, basically. So you don't agree that there's an element of caricature about her and her father, for instance? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. They were new subjects, totally new subjects. The language was used in a... The idiom was fresh and new and uh, uh, it sort of added something to the art of fiction. In, yeah, in fact, books. we were looking for, uh, looking you know, for that. That, 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 yeah. that kind of thing, some kind of innovation. 
uh, you know, some kind of contribution to the genre itself. I mean, the way novel is imagined and constructed, uh, which was one of the major considerations uh, while we were shortlisting and the kind of we cross decided. generic. Uh, yeah. uh, Discourse. I think there's an internal dialogue also going on between, uh, you know, earlier novels and and as as a tradition is emerging. So one can see now uh, not just you know what used to be earlier post-colonial writing writing back to colonial um, writers. Now I think there's a kind of writing back within the genre. The locale also was different sometimes out of India in India, and when in India it was quite rooted. It was quite rooted, you know. India did not come out as an exotic uh, land being sold to the Westerners. Yeah. Belonging to the country and also in a way belonging to the language in to which the they language, write. Yes. Otherwise, yes. They, there was a feeling that they were writing in an alien language and yes. they were rather obsessed with uh, this, uh, uh, this um, strangeness of the language in which they were writing. And that, I think that's what has made a difference. I, right from Salman Rushdie and Vikram Sayyid, I think there has been this difference that to them English is quite natural and they don't look at it as um, as if they were writing in a foreign language. They have decided to give the prize to the shy company of people who care, Rahul Bharacharya. Well, let me at the very beginning congratulate the winner, uh, which was uh, ab an absolutely unanimous choice. The novel, with its consummate artistry, it's a nuanced and understated narration. It's refusal to exoticize India or Guyana for that matter. Such exoticization being the bane of a lot of uh, Indian writing in English. It's non-judgmental attitude to the characters. It's insightful delineation of the tyranny of forced migration spawning generations of rootless and disinherited people. It's evocation of the landscape and understanding of its people, its humor that springs from a kind of detached sense of the absurd, the general grasp of the human condition that informs the whole work and its freshness of idiom is a definite contribution to contemporary Indian novel in general. Thanks very much. Thanks to the Hindu and Mirko. Uh, uh, I mean, there's so many giants on this list. It just feels, I feel like, I don't know, Amarnath running through the West Indian lineup in 83. <laughs> just a strange upset. Uh, was it the five incredible women I would actually like to thank? Uh, two in the Caribbean, uh, Vanisa Baksh and Auntie Marlene, uh, which is so incredibly generous when I went as a stranger uh, to the Caribbean. Uh, I mean, there's something I will never forget. My mother and my sister, for just, uh, well, I guess, uh, loving me and uh, just not making too many demands. And uh, the editor of this book, Shruti, who I think liked it enough because she's now my wife. And also, and to her more than anyone else. And thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> That's all. It was a fantastic experience and um, I know that every single session was worth our while because we had wonderful pa panelists and we had uh, great moderators and those who introduced were great fun as well and more than anything I think uh, the audience participation made a very big difference because uh, I think there was uh, everyone uh, took away a lot from this. I heard uh, discussions outside saying that they wish they had more time to speak to the panelists and they were uh, primarily very delighted to be able to speak to um, all the literati that was here and uh, for us it's been a very very enriching experience because uh, we felt that uh, the Hindu needed to do this to move out of our pages and to be a, a real live event and connect with our readers and our friends um, in a real live way. There came a period that we devoted our Sundays to cookery. These days began with Uncle Lance appearing in a shaky white Toyota 8192. With three short blows, he'd announce his arrival at half past five in the morning. Off we'd go in the drizzling day clean. He would lean suspiciously on the steering wheel as he drove, squinting at the windshield as if alarmed to find a world beyond it. He never, ever pushed the needle beyond a hair's breadth of 30 mph, an aspect I called attention to frequently. You ain't seen me drive by? I could read Georgetown to Kwakwani in 100 minutes. You know where is Kwakwani? You can't know as where. You've only been here a couple of days. 
Oh, my foot heavy. But you got to think for the other fool on the road, right? That is what an upstart like you don't understand. But there's nobody on the road, Uncle Lance, I pointed out. It had a time, right? We had nice zebra crossing upon the road. They were paint on things steady. Could see them stripes from a mile, eh? Shining upon the road. The stripes now vanish. The zebra done extinct. But there's nobody on the road, Uncle Lance. And jackasses, them does take an angle into the crossing. Are you not allowed that? You gotta start one side of the crossing and walk over till you reach the other side. Now people cutting in from any part of the road, cars in one bundle of confusion, and then they jump on the stripes and say, look, I spawned the zebra. Mm -hmm.